Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak in to the like button's house in the middle of the night and burn several bags of microwave popcorn. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. On February 15, 2004, two police officers drove down a quiet street in a little English village called Murrow, and they pulled over in front of this little brick bungalow. Earlier that day, a neighbor who lived on the street had called the police to report hearing a strange digging sound coming from inside of this bungalow. And so these officers had been sent out to see what the sound was and make sure the occupants of this home were okay. Now, these two officers were not particularly worried about the occupants of this house. They assumed that some wild animal must have snuck in while the owners were away, and that was all this was. But, as they would quickly learn, that was not the case. After climbing out of their car, the two officers just stopped and listened for a second to see if they could hear this digging sound. But the bungalow was quiet, the street was quiet, and so the two officers shut their car doors and made their way up to the front porch of this bungalow and knocked on the front door. After a few moments, when nobody answered, one of the officers reached down and tried the handle and found it was unlocked. And so he opened the door just a crack and he called called out through this opening in the door into the bungalow saying, hey, you know, it's police, we're here to check on you. But when no one called back to them, the officer opened the door the rest of the way and immediately both officers saw there was a huge problem inside of this house. The entire first floor was flooded with several inches of water and they could hear from somewhere in the back of the property the sound of running water. And so again, both officers called out into this house to try to get the attention of anyone who might be inside. And when again, they were met with silence, the officers walked into the flooded house and began walking straight back towards this running water sound. And eventually, after walking through the living room, they entered this hallway that went right to the back of the property. And as soon as they were in it, they could see there was an open door at the end of the hallway on the left. And it seemed like the running water sound was coming out of that room. And so the two officers, one by one, sloshed down this hallway to this room. They turned left, looked inside, and what they saw completely shocked them and immediately sprung them into action. Two months before these officers came to this bungalow and found it flooded with water, the owner of this bungalow, 51-year-old Ronald McLeagish, had broken up with his girlfriend. And this breakup was really hard on Ronald. He was already divorced. He was totally broke. He had loads of health issues like bad asthma. He had some liver issues. And just generally, he was someone who was kind of physically frail. And so this girlfriend had been one of the very few good things in his life. And now she was gone and he was alone again. And so very quickly after this breakup, Ronald fell into a very dark depression. And so for six weeks after they broke up, Ronald, for the most part, just stayed in bed and kind of moped around his bungalow, kind of feeling bad for himself. But then finally, at the end of those first six weeks after the breakup, Ronald decided he wanted to get his life back together and just move on. So on February 1st, 2004, so roughly two weeks before those two officers would come to his bungalow because of this digging sound, Ronald would wake up feeling determined to start anew. And the first thing he was going to do was purge his bungalow of anything that was his ex-girlfriend's. She left a lot of things behind when they broke up. She had not collected them. And so now they were just kind of sources of pain. And where most of her stuff was inside of Ronald's bungalow was in this closet in one of the bedrooms at the end of the hall. So that morning, Ronald headed down the hall. He turned left into the bedroom. He opened up the closet. He went inside and with a trash bag in hand, he began and rifling through everything in this closet and anything that was hers, he would take it and put it right into the trash bag. And at some point, when Ronald was almost done pulling the last few things of his girlfriend's out and into the trash bag, 
From behind him, he heard the strange sound coming from the bedroom. It sounded like wood bending or creaking, but before he could turn around to see what the sound was, the door to the closet he was in slammed shut with incredible force, and suddenly Ronald was trapped inside of this closet in total darkness. Now, Ronald was likely shocked at first, but he would have reached and tried for the handle and found that no matter what he did, he could not open this closet again. And so Ronald began screaming for help and pounding on the door, but nobody came to help him. The closet that Ronald was in was fairly tall, but it was only two feet wide by about two feet deep, which meant Ronald could only stand inside of this closet. He couldn't sit down, he couldn't bend down, he literally was trapped standing. And Ronald didn't have water, he didn't have food, he knew that no one was going to be checking on him anytime soon, and even though his bungalow was kind of small and shabby, it was built out of brick. And so the likelihood that his calls for help were penetrating outside loud enough that people could hear them and that they would come in and rescue him was pretty slim. And so at some point that evening, Ronald realized he needed to do something different if he was going to get out of this closet. And so above him were a series of pipes across the ceiling. And so he reached up and he grabbed one of them and he broke it off. He was likely thinking that with this pipe, maybe he can burrow a hole in the wall and crawl through to another room, or maybe he can punch a hole in the door and somehow unlock it, or at a minimum with the metal pipe, smashing it against the wall or the door would be louder than any noise he could make by yelling. However, the second he broke that pipe off the ceiling, something horrible happened. The pipe he broke was a water pipe. And as soon as it was broken, icy cold water began pouring down directly on top of Ronald's head and face. And again, because he can only stand basically in the middle of this closet, he couldn't get out of the way of this water. It was like he was under a waterfall and couldn't go anywhere. And so he likely tried to ignore the water and tried to use the pipe and screamed and do anything he could to get someone to know he was in here, but no one could hear him. And so it was like he was being tortured with this freezing water and he's in this tight claustrophobic space. It's total darkness and he's totally panicking. And for days and days, that would be Ronald's nightmarish reality. But despite how terrible his circumstances were, Ronald continued to use that pipe to both smash the walls to make loud sounds. He also began burrowing into the walls, trying to make a hole, but Ronald was getting weaker and weaker. He became very sick. And also because the water was constantly hitting his head and face, his skin got so saturated that literally his skin started falling off. It basically opened up into these sores and began to sag and the water just began brushing his skin off. And so finally, after about a week of being trapped in this closet in these terrible conditions, Ronald realized help was not going to come in time. And so he put his pipe down, he kind of slumped up against the wall and then closed his eyes. Ronald's neighbor who called the police actually did hear Ronald using that pipe to try to dig a hole in his wall. And she heard Ronald smashing the pipe on his door and she must have heard muffled shrieks and yells, but she didn't know what they were and kind of just decided it wasn't her business. But when Ronald's house went from all these strange sounds to silence, that was when she called the police and said, hey, I had heard some digging sounds coming from the bungalow and now I don't. And so when those two police officers arrived at Ronald's bungalow, they went inside, they went down the hallway, they went into the bedroom where Ronald had gone and they saw this huge wardrobe, which is a big wooden piece of furniture, toppled over right in front of the closet. And at the bottom of the closet, they saw two human feet protruding from underneath that little space at the bottom of the closet. Those feet belonged to Ronald. He had managed to force his feet underneath the closet it, but of course, he could not have fit underneath the closet door. And so the two police officers rushed over and together they barely were able to get this wardrobe off of the closet door. And when they opened the door up, Ronald was in there, he was deceased, his body was still in a standing position, kind of rigid and propped up against the wall, and freezing water was still pouring down onto his head. It would turn out no one had intentionally trapped Ronald. Instead, his wardrobe was just unstable and it happened to topple over at the worst possible moment.
On Thanksgiving morning in 1900, an 18 year old named Thomas Pedler told his mother that he was going out for a bit, but he'd be back in time for Turkey that afternoon. And then he grabbed his jacket and his coat and he headed out the door. Thomas lived in a very working class neighborhood in San Francisco, California, where generally speaking, nothing big really ever happened. It was kind of a place where people just worked and that was it. But on this day, something huge was happening in Thomas's neighborhood. The big football game between Stanford University and the University of California was taking place at the stadium in Thomas's district. And they were expecting over 20,000 people to cram into this stadium. And so Thomas was not about to miss this incredible spectacle even though he didn't have enough money to buy a ticket. But he knew he would find a way to watch this game. And so Thomas leaves his house and he runs to the stadium, which was not far from his house. And he waited in front of the front gate where all these people are streaming in to go into the stadium. And around 11 a.m., Thomas's very close friend, Charles, who was also a young man, made his way to the front gate. The two met up. And at first, their plan was to try to sneak in with the horde of people that were making their way into the stadium. But even though they were still hours away from the opening kickoff of this big game, it was at 2.30 p.m., the stadium was packed. I mean, there was nowhere to sit, there was nowhere to stand. People that had tickets who were going in are looking around thinking, you know, where are we gonna watch this game? And so Thomas and Charles are kind of like, well, what's the point of sneaking in if there's nowhere to watch? And so they decided, okay, we need to find another way to watch this game. And so they began looking around and they noticed there was a huge fence that lined the perimeter of the stadium. And they saw there were some people kind of climbed up on this fence trying to get a view down onto the field. And pretty quickly when Thomas and Charles decided they would try to do that too, they saw that all the good spots on this fence were already taken. The spots that were open provided no view onto the field. And so that option as well didn't work. And so Thomas and Charles are frustrated. They're starting to worry that they will not see this big game. But when they walked back over to the front gates of the stadium, they happened to notice across the street was this group of people rushing over to this big white brick factory building. And they were literally placing ladders up against the sides of this building and beginning to climb up it. I mean, this is a five story building and they are just basically free climbing the windows and the fire escape and Thomas and Charles realized that the top of this factory was flat and provided a perfect view down onto the field. And so all these people, they're trying to get a good seat to watch this game. And so without any hesitation, Thomas and Charles decide they're gonna do that too. So they left the stadium, they ran across the street and they began climbing up the ladders and climbing the windows and the fire escapes until finally they made it onto the roof, 55 feet off the ground. And when they got up there, there wasn't that many people. And so Thomas and Charles were able to run right over to the front edge of this building and claim a spot with an absolutely perfect view of the game. A couple of hours later at 2.30 p.m. when the game actually started, the rooftop that Thomas and Charles were on was now completely packed with people. Hundreds of people have climbed up onto this factory. There were some factory workers down below telling people, do not do this. Do not climb on top of this factory. It's not safe but nobody listened to them and the police either didn't notice this was happening or they didn't care. And so there's all these people that are on this roof. They're all super excited and the game has begun. It's 2.30 and as soon as the game started, it was like the crowd in the stadium, which could be heard very easily from this rooftop, just kind of erupted and there were all these bands playing in the stadium. I mean, it was chaos down below and it really caught on on the roof. All these guys, including Thomas and Charles, they're getting amped about this game. They're singing, they're chanting, they're screaming, they're yelling. I mean, it's total chaos and Thomas and Charles loved it. But about 20 minutes into the game, as Thomas and Charles are enjoying themselves and the crowd is still going wild, a dull cracking sound could be heard coming from one side of this roof. And so Thomas and Charles, they kind of spun around to see where this cracking sound had come from. And when they began looking out across the sea of people, they noticed on the far side of the roof where the sound had kind of come from, they could see people scrambling to get off the roof. But before Thomas and Charles and the other people around them who were watching this happening could figure out what was going on, there was a much louder cracking sound and suddenly the floor underneath Thomas Charles and everybody else 
collapsed. And immediately, people on this roof fell all the way to the bottom of this factory, 55 feet below. There weren't loads of floors inside of this factory. Instead, it was basically just one big building, 55 feet high, that housed this brick structure right in the center of the factory that was almost as tall as the entire factory. It was almost like the factory was a shell around this brick, smaller structure right in the middle that was like 40 feet tall. And so after the ceiling collapses, Thomas, he falls but miraculously, he lands on a wooden beam that stretched across the entire factory, like a support beam, and he grabbed onto it, saving himself from falling all the way down. And so Thomas, he only fell maybe five feet, so he was okay, but he didn't have a great grip on this beam. He was holding on, but just barely. And so Thomas, he turns and he's looking around at what's happened below him, and he's hearing people screaming, and he's hearing the sounds of people running around trying to help those who have hit the ground on the bottom. And Thomas, Thomas immediately begins scanning for Charles, and he finds him. Charles was one of the other fairly lucky people, at least in Thomas's mind, Charles seemed lucky, because instead of falling from the roof all the way to the ground, Charles and 15 or 20 other people had fallen right onto that brick structure that kind of made up the main part of this factory. And so Charles had only fallen maybe 10 or 15 feet onto this structure. And so Thomas is thinking, oh, Charles and these other people, they've survived this fall, they're okay. However, the second Charles and the others who supposedly were saved by landing on this brick structure, the second they hit, that brick structure, despite not suffering catastrophic injuries like broken bones and horrible internal injuries, these people on the brick structure began letting out these primal screams, these just horrible blood-curdling screams, and as they did, these loud popping sounds began coming out of their body, and then their bodies began contorting forward, almost like a bug rolling up onto itself. It would turn out this factory was not a normal factory. This was a glass factory, and in order to make glass, you need to heat sand and some other chemicals up to extraordinarily high temperatures. You need a furnace that can literally burn hotter than lava. And so that brick structure that was housed in the middle of this five-story tall factory was a glass furnace, and it was on. And so even though the inside of this furnace was the hottest place, it was over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the outside of this furnace, where Charles and the others had landed, believing they were saved from this 55-foot fall to their death, was still extremely hot. So hot that the factory workers couldn't even go near the furnace, even with special equipment on. The way they worked with this furnace was with these long metal pokers. They would work the flames and the glass at a distance. And so the instant that Charles and the others landed on the top of this furnace, they began to light on fire. Those snapping sounds that were coming out of their bodies was the sound of them instantly igniting on fire. And so Thomas and the others who had initially survived this horrible collapse watched as Charles and the others shrieked and shrieked and their bodies continued to contort and they continued to burn and smolder. And Charles actually, he would roll up so tightly that his body began to roll down the curved side of this furnace. And at some point, his body slipped into a crack in the furnace and he actually fell into the flames inside, at which point he went silent. Around the time that Charles and the others stopped shrieking, a number of people just out on the road heard the commotion and they came inside and one of them was Thomas's father. And in a terrible twist of fate, he actually looked up and saw his son clinging to the beam, Thomas Thomas, except it was so hot inside of this factory that Thomas was sweating, he was losing his grip, it was really hard to hold on to this beam, and his father watched as Thomas lost his grip and fell the 10 more feet down onto the furnace exterior. He landed feet first, then he fell onto his stomach and his face, he immediately ignited on fire, began shrieking, and then went silent. All told, 23 people would be killed during this roof collapse, and dozens and 
dozens more would be horribly injured and disfigured. This collapse goes down as one of the very worst disasters in sports history. However, on this day, the crowd inside the stadium was so caught up in the game that they actually didn't notice this horrible tragedy taking place just a hundred feet away from where they were. It wasn't until the end of the game when the winning team's fans carried their players in this kind of spontaneous parade out of the stadium to celebrate that they walked out onto the street and saw all these burnt up, rolled up corpses of the people who had landed on the furnace. In April of 1979, a 69-year-old woman named Monica Myers was appointed mayor of a little village called Betterton in the U.S. state of Maryland. Betterton used to be this very fancy resort town on the water where people from Baltimore and Philadelphia would come there for vacations. They had fancy hotels and restaurants and shops. But by the time Monica became Betterton's mayor, Betterton had kind of gone downhill. People had stopped coming to Betterton. All the hotels shut down or were abandoned or burned down. The summer homes of the rich people from the big cities, those got sold off. And down at the beach, all these glamorous boardwalks literally just kind of crumbled into the sea. And in their place were all these shanty towns where homeless people set up their camps. But Monica had grown up in Betterton. And so she really loved the town and wanted to improve it. And so when she became mayor in 1979, she really leaned into her new role way more than other mayors would. Instead of managing the village from an office like most mayors would do, Monica literally went out in town and just began doing lots of jobs around the town for free. She would ride around with the police and literally stop crimes in action. One time she stumbled across someone looting a vacant hotel and she personally got out, chased this person down and made them put everything back that they had taken. She would pick up trash on the beach, she would do random repairs on people's homes and businesses all over town, and sometimes she would just go door to door asking people how they were doing. And so very quickly, the people of Betterton really grew to love Monica, and they loved seeing her every single day just out and about making Betterton a better place. And so on March 20th, 1980, roughly one year into Monica's tenure as mayor, it was immediately noticeable to the people of Betterton when Monica was nowhere to be seen. That day, she did not go to the police station in the morning like she normally did. She was not seen at the beach doing her trash pickup and she didn't knock on anybody's door. And so by mid morning that day, the people of Betterton, all 120 of them, were basically out in force looking for Monica. And at 11.30 a.m., the police in Betterton got a call about Monica. It was this guy who was totally panicked. He could barely make a sentence. And he basically just told the police, you gotta get here now. And so the police hopped in their cars and they sped to the address this guy gave them. And when they got there, they saw it was this very plain boxy building that was kind of tucked back in the woods. It was far away from the town center and really nobody ever went over here. And the police, when they parked their cars, they saw the guy who had called the police, the distraught caller, was standing outside of the front door. He was obviously crying and he was waving for them to come over and follow him into this building. And so the police got out of their cars, they ran over to this guy and they're asking him, you know, what happened? Where's Monica? What's going on? But this guy was so hysterical, he really could not describe what happened to Monica. He just kept telling them to come on, come on, follow me. And so he led them into this building and pretty quickly they entered this huge warehouse where all across the ceiling were these big metal catwalk areas that kind of zigged and zagged all over this warehouse and below them all over the floor were these huge industrial sized 15 foot tall vats that contained something. And so this guy who had led police here, he stops and he just points at the nearest vat. And so the police, picking up his cue, begin walking towards this vat. And as they got closer and closer, they were hit with this horrible smell that made them gag and cough. And before long, they had to stop and kind of compose themselves. The smell was so bad. It would turn out this building that was kind of removed from the town center of Betterton was Betterton's sewage treatment plant. And that morning, Monica had gone to the treatment plant to help clean some of these 15 
15 foot tall industrial sized vats that contained human waste. She had done this enough times that when she was here, she did not need any supervision. And so that morning she was alone. She climbed up onto one of the catwalks over one of these big vats and she had reached down with her testing kit to test the sewage to see how much cleaning it would need. And as she did that, she somehow slipped and fell into the big vat of human waste. Now, she would not have immediately gone under. It was not like a liquid. It was more like clay or really thick mud, where at first she would have kind of been laying on top of the sewage. But as soon as she tried to move to get out of the sewage, the sewage would have functioned more like quicksand, where as soon as a part of her body went under the surface, it would not come up again. And so after the police composed themselves, they climbed up onto the catwalk and they looked down and they saw Monica, who was face down, partially submerged, inside of this fat and she was deceased. Her autopsy would reveal that she died of drowning, which means she literally inhaled human waste. $250,000. That's how much you all contributed to Dave Hartsock's GoFundMe page after we covered his story last week on our YouTube channel. Dave is the heroic skydiver who sacrificed his body to save his student. Now, because of that, Dave is totally paralyzed and fully dependent on his mother to take care of him. I spoke to Dave after all this money came in and to say he's happy is such an understatement. I mean, this literally changed his life and it's because of you. But as awesome as that is, our work is not done. There are other very deserving people that really could use our help. And one group in particular that really needs attention are the victims of violent crime as well as their families. And that is where the Mr. Ballin Foundation comes into play. Within days of the Uvalde Elementary School shooting, the Mr. Ballin Foundation sent $150,000 to support victims and their families. And going forward, we will continue to support them as long as they need support. This year, Year, in addition to all the donations we expect to receive, our company, Ballin Studios, which is a separate entity, is going to be giving $1 million to the Mr. Ballin Foundation, and all of it will go to the cause. We are not taking any money for profit in Mr. Ballin Foundation. Truly, 100% of donations that go into that foundation go to the cause. And if you don't know this, that is very rare for most charities. Usually, you got to pull money to pay for the organization, not for us. It is 100%. You give money to the Mr. Ballin Foundation, it goes right out the door to victims of violent crime and their families. So if you want to join forces with me and the Mr. Ballin Foundation and genuinely make a difference in the lives of people that so desperately need our help, go to mrballin.foundation and click on get involved at the top of the page. Once there, consider becoming a monthly donor to the Honor Them Society. These supporters not only contribute to the cause, but also they get free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Again, go to mrballin.foundation and click on Get Involved to see how you can partner up with me and the Mr. Ballin Foundation. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please sneak in to the like button's house in the middle of the night and burn several bags of microwave popcorn. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. We have a podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast that puts out brand new podcast exclusive stories on Monday mornings. And on Thursday mornings, we put out the remastered audio of our best YouTube videos. Again, it's just called the Mr. Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available exclusively on Amazon Music. Consider donating to our charity. It's called the Mr. Ballin Foundation, and it provides support to victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click on Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. We have two additional YouTube channels, Mr. 
Ballin Shorts and Mr. Ballin and Espanol. We also put out mere daily content on TikTok, Facebook, and Snapchat. All of those pages are just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Also, be sure you check out our studio's brand new website. It's ballinstudios.com. There you can access our merch, you can access our Discord server, you can see what events are coming up. Basically anything we're doing, it's going on that website, so go check it out. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.